I think reconciliation is bullshit. What does that word even mean? Where does it come from? Who does it benefit? It's distracting us from what's going on. These words are not my own. They were spoken by an indigenous woman at the National Youth Reconciliation Conference, which I attended this past February. Her words were spoken slowly and filled the room with a tension you could feel. I assume many people resonated with her bold statement and others like me experienced feelings of uncertainty about the future of reconciliation in Canada and what could be done to do its work well. Every year, the Canadian Roots Exchange hosts the National Youth Reconciliation Conference, which facilitates conversations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth, hosting dialogues on solidarity and reconciliation. It aims to challenge negative stereotypes and promote respect and understanding between all people living in Canada. I entered the conference weekend with what I hope was a posture of humility, recognizing that there is a lot I have to learn. There are many topics that circulated the conference, including the sacredness and importance of water, the cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women, the Colton Bushi and Tina Fontaine case verdicts, and the importance of retaining Indigenous language and culture. These topics bear so much weight and are deeply embedded in rich emotion and complex history. I find myself wanting to understand everything all at once, and as I do this, I realize that I expect to hear stories of immense pain and suffering of our Indigenous neighbours. I think the problem is that I expect. If we only look to hear struggles, stories of struggle, we miss the opportunity to learn about the incredible beauty of Indigenous culture. The beauty and their connection to the land and their immense respect for creation and all it has blessed us with. Woven throughout the weekend were pauses to give thanks to Creator, through both silence and through the beat of drums. With every Thanksgiving offered to Creator, I experienced a sense of welcome that was new to me, an invitation to realize the omnipresence of God and to question the ways I have limited our Creator. And just as we have limited God, we too have limited his creations in the way we separate ourselves from others and forget to celebrate the vast diversity of the body of Christ. I think a large issue that hinders relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people is the hesitancy involved in communication. One conference attendee voiced this well when she said, often as settlers, we are too anxious about offending, so we back away sometimes, which can actually be worse. We are scared of saying the wrong thing and doing the wrong thing, so we often dare not into the process of creating relationship at all. I wish I didn't have to admit that fear is a part of what holds us back, holds me back. We are scared of making mistakes, but if we want to be allies, we must try. One workshop facilitator said, realize that you're probably going to make mistakes, but it is not about your intent. It's about the impact. Sometimes you may have to apologize for doing something wrong. These words caught me off guard. I think we naively believe our pure intentions are sufficient. We forget to ask questions before we act and take pauses before we speak. This happens in our efforts to bring Indigenous culture into our education curriculums and communities, when we often unintentionally engage in cultural appropriation and tokenism. During a session on Indigenous leadership in post-secondary institutions, a master's student named Jordan Adelman spoke of instances where Indigenous elders are invited to classrooms to share. He suggested that we, can, we can't just welcome a token leader in to teach at any given time, expecting that they'll be available at our beck and call. We need to focus more on relationship. Speaking to the Indigenous youth in the room, Jordan stressed the importance of reconnection to culture. This included a suggestion to foster relationships with elders instead of doing what he called the snatch and grab. When we do this, we come to someone for information with the intention of learning and then leave once we think we've learned without spending the time to create relationship. I think we are all guilty of this at times, eager to learn, but not patient or committed enough to do the hard but rewarding work. I'd like to call myself an ally, yet there is nothing I'm doing to go out of my way to earn this title. Someone at the conference asked, are you an ally by conviction or an ally by convenience? When it's easy to advocate for Indigenous peoples, I will. Making the speech is easy, but I hope my convictions will take me further. I think we often perceive allyship as an action or an output of behavior. In doing this, we may be missing the importance of input or what we need to change in ourselves first. Which thought processes do we need to break down to stop perceiving Indigenous peoples as lesser people who need our help? 
In what ways have we forgotten that our very own histories of coming to Canada are built on the impression of Indigenous peoples? How do we devalue Indigenous ways of being, whether intentionally or subconsciously? We must be actively cognizant of our own prejudice, stereotypes, and deeply rooted worldviews. If we are not, I'm afraid our actions won't have much merit. Throughout the weekend, I heard echoes of the same phrase, education is the first step of reconciliation. This conference was my meek attempt to begin this journey, and I can say with gratitude that I have made some good steps. But I also recognize that every day, I need to work at understanding my own privilege because quite honestly, I often sit back and realize that I'm swimming in it. As a university student, I celebrate the opportunities I have to access rich education. Yet too often, I realize the significance of this blessing in hindsight, because it is shadowed by grumbling and apathy. I think I've come to expect education to fall right into my lap without having to do the hard work. My challenge to you then is also to me. How are you going out of your way to get educated? because I believe we sit in this privilege and forget every single day the gift of education that we have been given. We must go out of our way to learn more. And as we do this, we cannot expect that Indigenous people will provide education for us. We need to do the research ourselves. And when we do, we will discover ways of education that are untraditional in our opinion. We will be challenged to value these equally with our own set ways of thinking. And we must. For if we cling to Western thought, I fear we will be regressing instead of progressing. I spent a lot of my undergrad trying to create my personal definition for peace. I'm not sure I've gotten there, but I do have a pretty good idea of what peace is not. Peace is not believing that our ways are superior. It is not created when we limit marginalized communities to their stories of struggle and forget to see beauty in cultures different than our own. Peace does not occur when we are complacent in our own contributions to injustice and the process of peace is hindered when we think we need to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. It is our job, rather, to amplify their voices. In some ways, it is ironic that I began with words that are not my own. In doing this, I only hope to amplify the voices of many who believe that reconciliation is missing the mark. What did you think when I first said the words, reconciliation is bullshit? Did the phrase strike a chord? Did it increase your curiosity? Or did it slip past your radar? Each of these three reactions warrants a responsibility to be taken up. When we think we have the answers for reconciliation, I hope we consult our Indigenous neighbours first. When we are certain our Christian beliefs give us explicit direction to approach healing, I hope we question our own notions of what we believe God wants us to do. When we think our country is making progress and see the heartbreak of another broken verdict, I hope we go out of our way to express solidarity. And when we do not have the answers, I hope we'll have a posture of humility as we willingly accept and offer grace. Thank you.